Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. I've usually played it usually a few dozen times. Um, a lot of the playtesting comes from when we I put together digital versions of the prototype and I send it out to playtesters around the world in a process called blind playtesting. But you can't have it be too challenging. Nobody wants that game that you're still playing at two in the morning, or frankly, that's so hard to understand on the front end. Yeah, that's a big part of what I focus on, the idea of accessibility in many different ways. How can I make a game, a game accessible the first time you play it um, so that you want to play it another time? How can I make the rule book short and succinct enough but have great examples so that it's easy to learn? And how can I pick the right game length so that the game doesn't overstay its welcome? I'm Sarah Fenske. If you love board games, you've probably played one by Stonemeyer Games. They're responsible for such hit games as Viticulture and Scythe. Their breakout game, Wingspan, alone sold more than 1.3 million copies. They're based right here in St. Louis's Central West End. And joining us now with the company's story is Jamie Stegmeyer. He's a game inventor and he's the co-founder of Stonemeyer Games. Jamie, welcome. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Jamie, so many people love board games. What made you go from playing them to deciding, you know what, I'm going to make one? Well, I've been designing games just for fun as a hobby um, since I was a little kid. But as an adult, it's really been the inception and growth of Kickstarter that got me into the idea of actually designing and self-publishing a game. Hmm. And then my company has moved away from Kickstarter uh, over the last few years, but that was the original uh, the original impetus for me giving it a try. So you had a day job at this point, but you decided, hey, I'm going to put myself out there. Indeed. Yeah, I worked uh, at, at the time I was working at Washington University where I went to college. And uh, I continued that job for the first couple games that we came out with. And then I went full time at Stillmeyer Games in late 2013. So tell us about this first game. What was the idea where you're like, you know, I'm going to go for it? Yeah, it was a game called Viticulture, and I designed Viticulture specifically to hopefully uh, cross over between modern gamers, modern hobby gamers who often gravitate towards science fiction and fantasy themes, but also love uh, in-depth mechanisms. And I wanted to cross over into people who maybe hadn't tried out modern hobby games yet and wanted to try them for the first time. And so that was why I chose the theme of Viticulture. And uh, I just kind of ran with it from there. I did a lot of research about winemaking and how to, how to run a vineyard, and I tried to encapsulate that into a game where you get to make a lot of interesting and creative decisions as you try to run that vineyard. So this was more strategic. It didn't come out of like just a love of wine or owning <laughs> a vineyard. You were like, this would be a topic that would, would bring these two things together. I like your version better. That would be a better story. But no, it was a, a, a marketing strategy from the beginning. Yeah. Well, so you're kind of, I find myself getting stopped on this idea. How does the idea of winemaking appeal to people who are into sci-fi and fantasy? Well, one of the odd things that I've learned about uh, my, my fellow gamers, and anyone who wants to become a gamer, is that there's a huge spectrum of games that are set in the world of, world of farming. There are lots hmm. of these farming games. There's some di video games like that too, but there are a lot of really good, highly acclaimed farming tabletop games. There's something about it that appeals to, to many hobby gamers. And so that was why I, I kind of didn't feel too worried about trying out a game about running a vineyard because it has many similarities to farming. That's funny that farming games would be like the thing. Like, I guess, yeah. uh, you know, since we can't do what our ancestors did, we need to do it on a tabletop with a board. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so you started on Kickstarter. I mean, Kickstarter works great if you know exactly what you're doing. It can be a terrifying thing if you don't raise enough money, you don't get any money. If you raise too much money, there's huge problems that come with that. Did you really study um, as you were getting started in this? I did, yeah. I, I've kind of I've studied Kickstarter for many years. Even now and now that I no longer use it, I still study it to learn from some of the amazing things creators are doing over there. But yeah, what I basically did is I, I backed a number of campaigns 
uh, in 2010, 2011 to learn how other creators were effectively or maybe not effectively running their campaigns to mm. learn from what they were doing. And then I took, I tried to take those lessons into the Viticulture Kickstarter campaign, which ended up raising about $65,000, which was above our goal, fortunately. Okay. And so I just continued to learn from it from there. Yeah. And that was in that sweet spot. It wasn't so much that you ended up having to give away thousands of, of games that didn't exist at that point. Yeah, I mean, there was still risk because I'm, we're basically raising money. I'd already created the game, but I needed to manufacture a, min, a minimum print run of 1,500 copies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 942 backers and I ended up making 2,500 copies. So I ended up using some of those funds to make copies that I hope to sell beyond uh, Kickstarter itself, which ended up happening. But there was the risk there that those games just weren't going to sell. I was fortunate that they did. Okay. So this all started with Viticulture. How did you go from that to being all in on games? As you said, you, you eventually did quit your job at Wash U. Right. Yeah, I kind of tiptoed into it. So I ended up going part-time at that job for a little while. I, my boss was very generous and let me go part-time so I could... I was ended up essentially working two full-time jobs in 2013. Ugh. And so I went part-time at the one and... I ended up through the company saving up enough money that I could give it a try for a year. That was the approach I took. I, I didn't want to go all in. Like the day after we funded Viticulture, I didn't want to go all in. I wanted to kind of take baby steps into that world. And it ended up working out. I, we went from being a very small company back in, in those days to now having three full-time employees and revenue this year, probably over $20 million. Wow. So this has really worked. It has, yeah. I mean, our, our overall goal is to bring joy to tabletops worldwide. So that's the thing that I think about when I when I think of like, is it working or not? But it has worked out also as a career, which I, I'm very fortunate to have a career that I, I, I love doing every day. Yeah, I mean, you're living the dream. I think there's so many people who would love to design games for a living. And I'm sure it's not just all, you know, elaborate plots and, and dice rolling. But, <laughs> you know, what a cool creative job. So you're doing this now. Uh, wh what do you think makes Stonemeyer Games different than other board game companies? Companies. I think a lot of it. So I, I, I try to think about this because I do try to differentiate some of our games from other companies. Um, but there are a lot of great companies out there doing great things, making beautiful games uh, that uh, bring joy to people, that bring people together at the tabletop. And really, I think one of the things that that helps me uh, go every day and figure out what what decisions to make for Stonemaier Games that hopefully elevates our company pretty well is that I really do focus every little decision we make on trying to bring joy to people. Mm -hmm. So every little decision about art and graphic design and how we build our communities around our games and how we market them and how we price them, um, all of those decisions uh, and how we theme them, the mechanism, everything comes back to, can we can we bring joy to people? And I think that driving force, that, uh, that why at the center of our universe has uh, helped elevate our games to a certain extent. It's interesting. I can see, though, that that goal could be internally sometimes at war with itself. You say you're making mm. every decision and art and graphic design. Uh, good art and good graphic design isn't always cheap, and you still want to keep that price point something where people can afford to do this. Is that hard to balance those two things? It is at times, yeah. Uh, that's one of the advantage, it, slight advantages I have uh, of being both a designer and a publisher. So a lot of what I do are looking at all these numbers and how how the cost of graphic design and art, which is usually adds up to tens of thousands of dollars per game or per project, um, and then the the manufacturing cost of all our games, how that ends up equating into a final price for the consumer. So I'm, I'm always thinking about that. Sometimes I do have to make sacrifices and maybe cut something that would be really cool, but it's going to knock up the price of the game by $20. Mm -hmm. If it's not worth that $20 increase, then I might cut it. But I do try to I try to balance all those things. Uh, but it, yeah, it's definitely a balancing act. So let's talk about Wingspan. This is a game that yeah. is just a huge success. The idea here is you've got bird enthusiasts seeking to discover and attract the best birds to your network of wildlife preserves. I got to say, hearing that just in and of itself, I'd be like, I don't know. How does that work as a board game? How did that end <laughs> up being something where you decided we're going to do this with birds? And, and what makes this game such a smash hit? It certainly, as you describe it there, you're right. Like it, it wasn't something that I ended up, that I thought about publishing. It wasn't something that I, I had planned for years to do. Basically, we were approached by a designer, Elizabeth Hargrave, who had designed um, the beginnings of what I thought was going to be a really interesting game. And what drew me to that game when she pitched it to us is that she had designed all of these unique bird cards where the mechanisms on those, on those birds, like the gameplay level mechanisms, matched the theme of each of the individual birds so well. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, there's one bird in the game where this is a, a real bird in the real world that 
doesn't have its own nest. It, it lays its eggs in the nests of other birds, and it has those birds do the work to, to take care of those eggs. And Elizabeth took those, all those little thematic ideas and, captured, and encapsulated them into the, uh, the mechanisms of the birds. And that alone, I, I was just amazed by how well she did that. And I knew she had something special there. And then I worked with her to develop the mechanisms and give players a sense of satisfaction and progression as they played the game. All those other things that go into the development side of the game. But yeah, it was that original idea that she had. And although really not just the idea, but the work she did to put into designing all those birds that drew me to the game in the first place. It feels like just a real deep love and knowledge of birds. Is that helpful coming in? You know, you're, you're creating a dystopian alternate universe in the 1920s or, you know, mm. you're going deep on viticulture. Do you end up doing a lot of research um, just to get the underpinnings of these games right? I do, yeah. Like, yeah, with viticulture, I research winemaking a lot. For the other game you mentioned, Scythe, which is based on a, a, a fictional alternate history of, uh, of Europe where there are mechs instead of tanks. One of the things I did during the, the design process for it is that I plastered the wall behind my computer with all of the art that was being created for the game at the time because I partnered with someone who was kind of building this world through the art. And so every day I would look at this wall of art and ask myself, are the mechanisms that I'm trying to design for this game, are they matching what I feel when I look at this art? Are they capturing this experience? Mm -hmm. So yeah, some of it's research where I'm you know diving deep into everything I can learn about winemaking. And sometimes it's just figuring out if uh, the game is is capturing the experience that I'm going for. Hmm. So do you go into something like this? Do you start with the story? Like, yeah, we're going to do birds. Or do you generally start with the rules and mechanisms? Like we're due for a game that involves dice and, and sort of functions in this way. It's a little bit of both. I like the way you asked that because there definitely is, there are times where I, I look at a game and I, I think, okay, this would be interesting, but we already have a couple games like this. I'd rather focus on something else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes a game starts with a mechanical idea. Sometimes it starts with a thematic idea, a world that I'm trying to build off of or build from. Like we have a new game called Red Rising that's based on a wonderful novel series that I love. So I designed the game based on uh, this novel series. And sometimes it's a game submitted to us, like the, like in the case of Wingspan, where uh, Elizabeth worked really hard to design this game, to play test it, to get into a place that, where it was what, was a lot of fun. Um, and she submitted it, it to us, and we helped work with her on it from there. In the end, it comes down to the fun. Whether it mm -hmm. starts with a mechanical idea, a thematic idea, we are trying to make the game as fun as possible. You mentioned you have a brand new game. How often is it that you're releasing something new into the market? Something we've tried to do is be um, fairly intentional about how many games we release. So we only release one or two new games a year, and we usually plan a few years ahead. With the idea being that uh, I really want to show people when we design, when we release a game, that that game is really special to us. That we put everything that we could into that game, and we really shine a big spotlight on it. Opposed to releasing a new game every month. Um, yeah, that's why we try to do one or two ga new games a year, and then a few expansions to game, a few ancillary products every year. We're talking today to Jamie Stegmeyer. He's the co-founder of Stonemeyer Games. That's right here in St. Louis's Central West End, putting out a number of games that are, are considered works of art. Um, also games that are really popular for people who are looking for just a, a board game. They, they can get saturated in a world and um, games based on novels. I mean, Jamie, it's just it's fascinating how far games have come since I was a kid playing Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they really have come quite so it's quite far yeah if there's a theme that someone loves i bet there's a wonderful modern hobby game that has that theme in it so it, it almost seems i mean of course games have innovated everything has innovated and yet you know we're at this stage of life where people have these little screens they carry around in their pockets we're connected to everything in the world that's interesting at all times and and mm -hmm. so many people are sucked into that why do you think people still play board games when, you know, let's face it, there's virtual reality. You don't have to pretend this world based on a, a flat game. Yeah, I, I, I am continually amazed by that. But I spend every day looking at two computer screens and I love being able to turn off those screens or turn off my phone and just focus on creative problem solving on the tabletop with a beautiful game in front of me, something I can pick up and touch with my hands as opposed to just a mouse or a keyboard and where there are people around the table looking me in the eyes face to face, which I know we don't always get during the pandemic, but mm -hmm. um, it is really nice to, to be able to do that with people. And I also love the, the like I'm an introvert myself, um, but I do love being around people. And I find that games offer a really nice structured interface for me to have a great time with my friends um, 
And I, I think games are, are really, really great for introverts in that way. It's interesting. I never thought about that. But yeah, the fact there's kind of like an ending point, like you know you're not going to be yeah. stuck at this table with people <laughs> for eight hours. This game is probably going to be done in two. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So is that a complication as a designer? You're trying to find something that's going to be challenging, but you can't have it be too challenging. Nobody wants that game that you're still playing at 2 in the morning, or frankly, that's so hard to understand on the front end. Yeah, that's a big part of what I focus on, the idea of accessibility in many different ways. How can I make a game game accessible the first time you play it um, so that you want to play it another time? How can I make the rule book short and succinct enough but have great examples so that it's easy to learn? And how can I pick the right game length so the game doesn't overstay its welcome? Uh, those, among many other decisions like color blindness and, and inclusivity, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm always trying to make our games as accessible as possible. So by the time you actually release one of these games, how many times would you say, on average, have you personally played it doing that kind of fine tuning? I've usually played it usually a few dozen times. Um, a lot of the playtesting comes from when we, I put together digital versions of the prototype and I send it out to playtesters around the world in a process called blind playtesting. Mm-hmm. So people are learning the game around the world and offering me feedback through forums and emails and things like that. So usually a game has been played a total of 200 to 300 times by various playtesters, usually just a few dozen by me though. Wow, playtesting. There's this whole world out here. And I got to say, I kind of came in thinking, you've got the dream job. You've also got a really complicated job. This isn't just as, as simple <laughs> as drawing up this world. I'm, I'm newly impressed. I imagine the pandemic made things hard in ways that you didn't even anticipate. It did. It, it, it made it difficult to playtest for a while. I'm very thankful for the vaccination so I can get together with people who are, who are also vaccinated mm-hmm. um, to playtest. But uh yeah, it, it was, it, it, but it was also actually fairly good for business. I think people needed uh, something to do at home when they weren't able to get out and do the, the many social things that we did, especially last year. Mm-hmm. And so it was, uh, it was a great time for board games, I think, for people to be invited into the board game hobby for the first time. Yeah, I imagine there probably was huge demand, and yet we have all these supply chain problems. I mean, were you able yeah. to get board games into the hands of everybody who wanted them at the height of all this? Oddly enough, last year, yes. This year has been much, much more difficult with all the freight shipping delays. I'm sure you've seen many of the, the, the news about how, how clogged up the ports are and things like that. We have some containers right now that are buried under a bunch of other containers in Seattle that I'd Ugh. love to get to our web store, things like that. So yeah, there are huge supply chain issues right now, but I th- I'm hoping they'll be resolved in the next couple of months. So there's some optimism there. One last thing I wanted to ask you about today. You're not just building this company, you're building it here in St. Louis. Has that been a good place to have a board game company located? I love having my company here in St. Louis. Yeah, I've been here since 1999 when I um, moved out here to attend Washington University, but I love being in St. Louis. And the gaming community here is fantastic. From the the miniature market is a store here in St. Louis, one of the biggest stores uh, in, in the world, or, and it's right here in St. Louis. There's a wonderful cafe called Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe. It's a wonderful place to go play games. And there are little conventions, especially one called Geekway to the West, which is a very welcoming, family-focused convention where you can just go and play games for a couple of days. That happens every year. So all these things, among many others, I, I think make St. Louis a wonderful gaming community. So you're kind of surrounded by a lot of energy in that space. Does that drive you that you, you you know, you actually can see people who are into your games can't wait for the next one. It's a motivating factor. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what the, that's what the hobby is all about, being able to see people playing, having fun playing games. Yeah. Well, Jamie Stegmeyer, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a little glimpse into this fascinating world. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was great to chat about. This episode was produced by Jane Mather Glass, with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Doerr and production assistance by Jane. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.